Welcome to Lessons in Leadership, number one leadership show anywhere, anytime. Mary Gamba, how are we doing today, Mary? Doing really great, Steve. How are you? I'm great. We're bringing our good friend Tim Hogan in just a second. Mary, let's plug, please, our sponsors, because we understand that leadership and business development is closely aligned. And so is being able to see. So I'm going to put on my glasses for the plugging of our sponsors because uh, throughout the years of Lessons in Leadership, I'm getting older. Uh, so I would like to thank Veolia, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, New Jersey Sharing Network, Seton Hall University, Go Pirates, and the Bacino Leadership Institute, North Ward Center, Bedway Associates, Inc., our newest sponsor, and Delta Dental of New Jersey. So thank you to all of our wonderful friends, partners who make this show possible. In addition to News 12 Plus, you can see us on Apple Podcasts. You're going to hear us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Audible, blah, 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 blah. Um, here he is. <laughs> see, Tim, Tim wanted to know how serious we were, and I'm saying blah, blah, blah before I introduce him. Our good friend, Tim Hogan, <laughs> I'll use my glass as well. Tim Hogan is uh, several things. Number one, he's the Executive Vice President, Hair Transformation Services, otherwise known as CTS, Hackensack Meridian Health, our longtime partners, and also President Chief Hospital Executive, Riverview Medical Center, one of the many healthcare organizations, hospitals within the HMH universe. Good to see you, Tim. Good morning, Steve. Good morning, Mary. Happy to be here. Thanks for bringing me up. You got, hey, Tim, let everybody know where Riverview is and the community you serve. The community we serve is uh, Red Bank. Uh, the surrounding communities are Middletown, Shrewsbury, Tinton Falls, uh, in Rumson, and Little Silver, and Fairhaven. Got it. Hey, Tim, listen, we, we've said this many times when you've joined us and other folks from HMH, is that we've been fortunate for the last several years to be involved in the Physician Leadership Academy, the Hackensack Meridian Health Physician Leadership Academy, that Tim has been a key player in making that happen. Tim, to what degree, and this is not an effort to, to kiss our own butt in public, but how about this? To what degree have you really seen the development of physicians who are extraordinary surgeons and do incredible things transform themselves into the kind of physician leaders they need to be over the last several years? You know, I think the program has been a huge success for a variety of reasons. Uh, first and foremost is the commitment that the organization had from the board level to Mr. Garrett, to executive leadership and from our phys executive physician leaders who had, had served in leadership positions. Um, one of the things I think that's made the program a success, Steve and Mary, is that we've stepped back and we had to and really rethought the way that we were providing, uh, educating and training these physicians. And we've, we've kind of moved and shucked and jived as we've gone. I think we've provided meaningful discourse with respect to online training, with respect to counseling, with respect to mentoring, with respect to involving them in real life strategic initiatives with leaders in our organization. And that's really resulted in a number. And when I say a number, we're probably reaching about 15 to 20 executives who graduate into real executive positions, executive leadership positions at HMH. As a matter of fact, in the office next to me is Marilyn Localata, who has been a longtime OBGYN physician and is now the chief medical officer of Riverview Medical Center. And she is a graduate of that program. So it's been a tremendous success and hats off to you and Mary for just providing unbelievable leadership in terms of teaching, mentoring and guidance and counseling. Well, it's been incredibly reward rewarding for both of us because we see these physicians who do so much and also the nurses are extraordinary as well. Those are on the front lines, respiratory therapists, but for us to work with those physicians and to help them in areas where they have not been trained and coached and to see them make uh, even make an even bigger difference is is very rewarding. Mary, jump in with Tim. Yeah, definitely, Tim. One of the things that you just said really resonated with me, and we often talk about impact over activity. And when you talk about the fact that you had pivoted and we made conscious decisions with the Leadership Academy, we went in with a plan and said, you want to know what? What if we got more creative and changed this? To me, that's more impact over activity. What is one of the dangers if a leader just says, oh, I have all this activity, all this stuff, look at all that I'm doing, but there's not really any impact coming out of that? Yeah, that's a danger. I think, uh, you know, sometimes I look at my desk and I see a manila folder that is totally discolored because it's been sitting there for two years. And I think to myself, you know, what did I do as a leader to really put that in the, in the position that it's not supposed to be in? I think that Leaders often mistake activity for getting results. And I think you've got to focus in 
You've got to understand what you're trying to achieve. You've got to pull in the right people. You've got to provide sound leadership in terms of guiding that project or activity through. And then you've got to understand when you really hand it off to delegate. And I think that's where people really get lost and they, they get caught in this circuitous, uh, you know, constant, um, you know, hamster wheel of just activity. And they, they really think to themselves, I'm getting things done when really nothing is getting things done because they didn't organize it the correct way. They didn't lead it through uh, with, with pace leadership, uh, understanding that they needed to stay in that process until it was good enough along to pass off and delegate to other executives or leaders to carry it through. Hey, Tim, let's, uh, follow, um, let's follow up on the delegation thing. Tim and I have known each other for a lot of years, and, and let's just say uh, we have different ethnic backgrounds, but we're both micromanagers. I have no idea what the segue was there. That has no makes no sense. <laughs> I wonder where you were going with that one, Steve. That That's a no stretch. Sense. Let's edit that out. No, in all seriousness, <laughs> yeah. Tim, we're both micromanagers on a certain level. And I actually mean that as a compliment because is for as long as Tim has been a leader and, and I've been leading, the details matter. But here's the problem, Tim, and I want you to talk about this. You talked about delegation. How the heck does a micromanager, a type A micromanager, a guy, Mary's in our camp as well. Her ethnic background has nothing to do with it, but she's just totally into it. How the heck do you find, how do you pull back, Tim, delegate and know that you're sitting there going, I could do this in two seconds, but that's terrible leadership over time, is it not, Tim? Yeah, it is. I think you I think you grow into the role of understanding when to delegate. I think it comes with experience. I think it comes with having a lot of responsibility where you may have a ton of things to do and you've really got to delegate. But de delegation is a double edged sword. And I'll what go back mean? to it's a double edged sword because I think people can either delegate responsibly or they choose not to delegate and take too much on their hands and things don't get done well. And I think that's where I mentioned it before. Pace leadership comes in. A mentor and a teacher, John Lloyd, was a big disciple of pace leadership. Pace leadership envision a flock of geese. At any given time, you've got one goose who is in front leading that squad wherever they're going. And then at some point, they drop off and go to the back of the formation. Pace leadership is designed to do just that. It means that the leader helps to strategically develop an idea or concept, brings together the right people, but stays with that project in a leadership position coaching, teaching, mentoring, bringing it along, making mm. sure that it's going where it needs to go. And at some point, you have the right people who've been with you. You've solidified what the uh, initiative is, is all about. You've bought it along far enough that you can see implementation and you know it's the right time to delegate, step back and go to the back of the formation. Now, you mentioned Bob Garrett before. Uh, Bob Garrett, CEO of, of HMH, uh, Hackensack Meridian Health. Big on innovation pushing innovation, status quo, never an option. Talk real quickly, uh, Tim, about the connection between leadership, great leadership, not average leadership, and the constant need to innovate. Well, I think, listen, I, you know, all great organizations probably never met an idea they didn't love. The difference between successful organizations and organizations that really can pull it together and move ahead is you've got to know when to take an idea and discard it, and when you really want to push full steam ahead on a certain idea and innovation. And it really starts with a big picture. And Mr. Garrett is a great leader and you know he's a big picture thinker uh, where we say, where is our organization heading? Where, what do we want it to look like? What does innovative mean in our minds? And how do you break that down? So you take an idea like an idea, a phrase like innovation, it can mean a million things, but you've got to be able to break that down and provide detail of how that applies to our organization and healthcare and say, our organization is going to do this, this, and this. And it's all innovative. And Mary, a last question for Tim, because Tim just talked about the connection between leadership and logistics. I mean, a million ideas, but as Tim said, getting it done, another story. Real quick, Mary. Yeah, definitely. Uh, lifelong learning, that's something that we live, breathe, sleep, eat, die, sweat every single day. The three of us here, but for the people watching today, talk about why lifelong learning is so important and what that means to you. You know, lifelong learning to me, I think, starts with being a good listener. We're trying to be a good listener because there are so many people that I work with and I'm around that are so much smarter than me. And I can learn from them and understand that if I just shut my mouth and listen, I will really gather needed information to do a better job in my role. 
Um, I think it's important from the perspective of keeping your mind fresh, you know, keeping your mind busy. And I also think that, you know, if you're a lifelong learner, you're going to be able to go out and in these kind of roles, um, you know, be educated enough and confident enough and have the ability to really go out and lead people and help them be innovative and help them be more successful and help mentor them and teach them and lead them in the direction that we as an organization need to go. So that's important on a professional level and on a personal level, it's important to, you know, for me, it's important to keep myself busy out of work, to look at new things, to read, uh, to get involved in what I like, which is, you know, woodwork and carpentry and what have you. Whatever it is, whatever turns you on, you just need to keep at it. You know, a real quick, uh, with the woodwork thing, I don't relate to because I don't do anything with my well, hands. I was just going to say, that is something new. I, I didn't know if Tim was being facetious. Are you really into no, woodworking? No, he really, no, he really <laughs> does. I never knew this. Well, I'm not going to hawk my product, but I will on a future <laughs> show. <laughs> but real quick, Tim, you mentioned reading. And I, Mary's sick of my emails at all hours saying, Mary, do me a favor. Can you order this book and have it sent to my house? This John Meacham book on Abraham Lincoln, there's a million books on Lincoln, but this one's different. The reason I mention is because you go on our website, Sylvester will put up our website. We keep changing the lessons in leadership, leadership library, because there's always a new book on leadership. So to Tim's point about lifelong learning, you stop reading, you're in trouble. You think you know it all? Think again. Hey, Tim, thank you. It's an honor and pleasure to be your partner and partners with HMH with the HMH Physician Leadership Academy. It's been an extraordinary honor for Mary and I and our company. Thanks, Tim. Pleasure's been all ours. Thanks, Steve and Mary. Good to see you and uh, happy holidays. That's right. We're taping this right around the holidays. Happy holidays, Tim. Happy New Year, everyone. This will be in 2023. Be right back after this. This edition of Lessons in Leadership is made possible by the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, the North Ward Center, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Fedway Associates, Inc., and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com, NJBIA, and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIANJ, and Commerce Magazine. This is the Seton Hall story, one that comes to life every day on our campus. This is the place where great minds discover, innovate, collaborate, and find their true calling. This is the place where passion has a purpose, where learning inspires leading. The bonds we make, the values we teach, inspire our community to take heart and take action. This is Seton Hall University. This is what great minds can do. We are honored to welcome our colleague, longtime friend Jackie Chicarico, who is the executive producer of a terrific series called Think Tank with Steve Adubato, and also executive producer and co-host to re remember them that Jackie co-anchors with me. Jackie, how are you doing today? I'm good, Steve. Happy to be on Lessons in Leadership with you and Mary. <laughs> yeah. Does this have a different vibe? It does, because I know you both. I've known you for so long, and uh, you know Mary being... One of my coworkers since the time that I started with Caucus until now is great, and just to be able to hang out, have a conversation. <laughs> so, but but even though this is about Jackie as a leader, and we've seen her grow tremendously by way of background, Jackie, we met when you were a student at Montclair State University, correct? Yeah, MSU. I uh, went there as a broadcast major. Uh, I think first I went in thinking as a broadcast major, okay, I'll be able to do some behind the cameras things and produce, maybe dapple in a few other things. And in the back of my mind, I always thought, hey, maybe one day I could do something on camera. It was always kind of a pipe dream, I thought, because it's hard to break in and uh, be able to be in front of the camera. And you've given me the opportunity to do that. So I'm really grateful for that. And it's been really fun to learn along the way, learn from you, from Mary, uh, and just really try to uh, take this as a big learning opportunity and use it as a skill builder. Uh, and it's been really fun. 
Mary, isn't it amazing that Jackie and I were in class together? I, I always, when you brought that up, I forgot about the history and I forgot about how and where we found Jackie. And I'm just so yeah. grateful that we did find Jackie. Well, no, well, it was we're me not and Jackie hired too. The two of Hold us on. were together at MSU in your class. And uh, yeah. I think what happened, I'm pretty sure, but <laughs> I have bad long-term memory, but I think I reached out to you and your organization and just was like, hey, you guys hiring? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I I recall now that you're saying that, Steve said, oh, there's this talented young woman in my class. And I'm like, oh, here we go. And, <laughs> and you know, because Steve will run into people and he'll he'll say, oh, you know, I gave this guy at ShopRite your business card. So he's going to call you. And, and But I, I am so grateful that you came to us. So I want to be clear. I was teaching a, t a course in journalism and media uh, at Montclair State at the time, and Jackie Chicarico, who was not Jackie Chicarico at the time, and and Jackie Hire, not Jackie Hire at the time, two two really talented young students who you see potential in. Jackie Hire is still with us as the executive producer of State of Affairs, and also has a larger role in terms of programming overall. But Jackie, this is a second run with us. And the reason I say this is because you took some time away. And during that time, you did a lot of important things. So as we talk about leadership, one of the things is this. You have two young daughters. Your daughters are how old? Uh, seven. One just turned seven. And the other one is about to turn five. So let's talk about this. You cannot talk about leadership without talking about the incredible challenges of work-life balance. Now, we're pretty flexible at our organization. We Family first is not just an expression for us. Hopefully, our team members believe that we believe it. How the heck do you lead and manage it all? And also, Rich, your husband's a big part of it as well. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's funny that we both work from home. I'm in this room and he's right in that room over there. Uh, we both work from home. Uh, I feel like we're husband and wife, but we're also co-workers. We're friends. I don't know. It's it's all very blurred lines here when, when you've uh, gotten into this new routine of of, uh, you know, this post pandemic world, right? We're all in this virtual world still, which is really bizarre. And it definitely has its benefits. Like you said, family first. I'm so lucky that at this point in my career and my life, I can still do drop offs and pickups at school. Um, I can still be with my kids um, if they want me to volunteer like I did last week at the book fair that my, my daughter Lily was so excited for me to do. Things like that that are just, um, you know, irreplaceable time spent. With, you, like, you know, Steve and Mary, your kids grow so fast. So being Too there- fast. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Being there and available and accessible and as much as I can be um, during this time in our lives is so important to me. But also there's a lot of challenges working from home as well. Being a mom to young kids, uh, they know I'm here. <laughs> They're very well that, aware that I'm here. Um, after school, I'm lucky that I have a babysitter a couple of days a week that helps out. But if somebody gets hurt, if somebody's really upset about something, they're going to run to me no matter what. <laughs> we have boundaries set. They know if I'm working, they can't bother me. But they know too, if I'm like working and I'm just like doing emails or if I'm working like on a tape day and I'm on camera, like right now, they know they really can't bother me, but uh, they've learned <laughs> that uh, yeah. they can come barging in the room hysterically crying if something goes wrong. So during those times, it is challenging because my brain has to shift, right? I have my brain's constantly shifting gears. Okay. Now I got to be mom right now and help out, but then I got to jump back to what I was just doing. So Mary, jump back in here because the whole, someone might ask, well, what does this have to do with lessons in leadership? And Mary and I have also, Mary's built this company with me for the two decades plus, our production company. And we believe that you really do need to, everyone says, my wife says to me, stop saying it's your family. They're people you work with. I go, I know, but I want to create an environment that's family-like, meaning their families are a priority to us. Is that BS, Mary? Because um, we've tried to live that. I don't know if we've succeeded. I, I believe that you can try to live it in your actions, in exactly what you've done, even pre-pandemic, Steve. I don't want to make I, this about what I'm doing. This is about no, no, but, it, but this others. is this is organizations everywhere, it, and we yeah. constantly say that it's it's with the small exception of again law enforcement. Obviously, there's not that that much flexibility there, but a lot of offices are realizing, hey. Family family does come first. As long as you're not taking advantage of it, 
be there for your kids' Halloween parade. Be there, as Jackie said, for the book fair to volunteer because that time is so short. We have adult children now, and I can't believe that I could even say that. Mine are almost 18 and 21, and the time goes by so fast. But it is so important for organizations to make sure, especially in this hybrid work environment, to let their team know, hey, family comes first because you want to know what's going to happen. Those people are going to give a heck of a lot more into their workday because they're going to feel valued and appreciated, which we all do here for sure. And, and I, I want to jump in and say balance. I think that word is so funny because there's never true balance. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, day to day, there's not balance between all the hats I wear in my life, mom, wife, my career, friends, family, but month to month, those shift and evolve. And I think that's okay. I don't think you need to strive to have balance every single day in all aspects of your life. I mean, you're just setting yourself up for failure in that way. Um, but balance in, in in a month span, like for me, December is very busy for work and that's going to take priority over maybe seeing some friends this month, some um, things that you know friends are doing that I'm not able to attend um, and things like that. But that's okay. And, and those things evolve and change. But being able to, like we said, have the balance of in a day, if I my kid's sick, like, not going to lie, Lily's downstairs with a sore throat, didn't go to school today, set her up in front of the TV. <laughs> and that's just what I have to do for the day. And that's okay, because I have that balance here of being able to do that. But, but, but Jackie's left something out. And, and so is Mary. And I'll, I'll do this about Mary first. Mary's talking about her two sons. Um, Will is away at school, but also uh, Joe, her son, Joey. Mary took a few days, right as we're, we're taping at the end of 2022, it's just, Mary was like, look, Joey's in this performance. It's a big performance. I've got to be there. And I think you were there for a couple of days and you invested that time to be with him because yeah. he'll be off to college soon enough. It, it, yeah, it's exactly. But you but need what to- What does that have to do with leadership and organizational culture? Blah, 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 blah. Well, it, it's also showing by doing, right? It's showing by your actions. And literally, as Jackie said, just because I was doing that during the day on that Thursday, I made sure whether it was the night before or on the weekends, yes, I'm always by my phone, always. And if, if you can't reach me, you know, I'm either like in an MRI tube, getting an MRI or, or literally just indisposed. And, but literally you need to let your team know, listen, I want you to be doing that and spending that time with your family and in select, you know, situations. And they are few and far between. And Jackie, I could promise you the balance is going to shift dramatically because once you get your kids have driver's licenses and they're doing their own thing, sure. I didn't see Joey <laughs> yesterday until 8 PM. So a 12 hour stretch and he didn't need me for anything mm -hmm. until he needed like my credit card for college applications. So the shift will change. Uh, but yes, being adaptable and aware of those shifts is extremely important. And the thing Jackie left out is in the middle of all this, she runs, I think, a half <gasps> marathon. Where was the I, half yeah, Talk I about did. that. <laughs> Why? I did. <laughs> what, what's well, it, it was in Princeton. Um, it was a very, very hilly course, I'll have to say. Um, and why? Because uh, two years ago when the pandemic hit, uh, and I, like you said, I wasn't really working. I was freelancing. Three at the years, time. Jackie, go ahead. So three years ago. Yeah. Well, three two years, years ago March. was when I did. Well, yeah, it was after, so the pandemic okay. hit and I was like, okay, well, I'm stuck home with my two young kids. I have no outlet. Um, I've always worked out, but I've never considered myself a runner. And I started running. And part of the reason was to run away from my kids <laughs> and my husband just for a little bit. I just needed needed space, needed some time to clear my head. And I got that time to just think about putting one foot in front of the other. And that's all I had to think about during that moment, wow. uh, during that 20 minutes or a half hour, or two hours. Um, and then I saw that Princeton was doing their half marathon, but virtually at that time. And I said, you know what? I need a goal. I'm signing up. I'm going to do it. So I signed up and I did the half marathon by myself virtually on my own, on my own course that I created uh, with family and friends at the finish line for me, created my own finish line. And it just gave me so much pride. I was so proud of myself. And I, you know, I, I was like, okay, this, I'm going to keep running. So I kept running the past couple of years, but then this year I said, you know what, I'm going to sign up for that half marathon again. 
torture myself. Why not? And I wanted to do it in person because it, there's such a difference between running by yourself or running with thousands of people that all have the same goal in mind. So uh, I signed up again. This training period was definitely a lot harder because of the time commitment and how much more time I need to be giving now to work and family and my kids and their schedules too. Uh, so it was definitely a lot harder this time around. And the course was insanely difficult, but I finished on November 13th. Then I crossed the finish line in two hours and five minutes, which was a better time than I thought I was going to get. <laughs> and um, again, it, it brought me so much pride, but also my kids were there and they saw me and that meant so much more to me for them to see that they can do anything that they want to put their minds to. And, uh, you know, most of the things that I do, I do it for them. You know, it's interesting as, as Jackie talks about this, Mary, <clears throat> Jackie ran the uh, half marathon. I do Peloton with my wife and, and, and Mary walks the dog at night. So, uh, <laughs> walking very yeah, important. I mean, why very does it healthy. sound like that's just so minimized? Three no, miles. No, I, Mary, stop. I, I, she walks the dog and I do the Peloton <laughs> and I walk the dog. I will never, and I'm going on record, I will never run unless I'm running away from someone. <laughs> but, okay. but you know what? Those things are so important. Health and wellness is so yeah. important. And, and you have to find yeah. that outlet for sure. Yeah. Mary, any Mary, any way I'm you're doing walking. Jackie, I need to officially apologize to Mary. Because <laughs> I know when she's peeved. And I tell her about it. She's like, did he just did he do just that say, on air with she me? walks her dog. No, I meant that it was a bad joke. It was, my humor is terrible. But <laughs> no, Jen, but it is. She, health and wellness. Mary and I talk about wellness and leadership all the time. Mary walking yeah. the dog is her and her wellness. We've said this a million times. Mental health. But yeah. What, that, for you, I, what does that have to do with being a better leader? You know, I just find that you have to find things that you do just specifically for yourself uh, to lessen your mental load. For me, you know, waking up at 445 in the morning to get to a boot camp class at 530 is not the easiest thing. But once I get there and I get it done, I just feel so much better for the rest of my day. I feel yeah, like I can clear. take on the world. Yeah, I feel like I can just take on the world. And that sets me up for a successful day. When I don't do it, I definitely yeah. feel more sluggish. I feel like I'm not at my best. Um, so it is, it's an important aspect of, of yeah. my daily life. Jackie, sorry for interrupting. El um, Elvin's saying you got 90 seconds left. Mary, I'm going to do this real quick. We've yeah. often said behind Jackie's back, and this is a real leadership thing, uh, makes her a strong leader that Jackie is very receptive to feedback. I mean, Jackie does re remember them with us and I've critiqued and given her feedback and I can see right now how much she's taken. I'm not gonna go into detail about what that is. Why are you so receptive to feedback? Because it's just important for growth. If you think that you're doing everything to the best of your ability every day, that's great. But you know that there's always room for improvement. I mean, I'm not the best mom every day. I'm always trying to be the best, but I know I, I have room for improvement there as a wife and, you know, in my career and what I'm doing with you and with Mary and our whole team. And, um, you know, I want to be able to also be able to give that feedback to our team members as a mentor to them. Uh, I think it's just so important. I, I read an ESPN uh, article recently that said, I, I want to bring it back to the running and the sport. The 30 seconds left, Jackie, you know, broadcast. Okay. I know. So, you know, it says about 80% of women who are at the top of their companies and Fortune 500 companies um, played sports at some point in their lives. And I think that transcends over time to just show that um, being a leader is part of being a team and that's accountability and teamwork and setting goals and, um, you know, just being able to receive feedback and give feedback as did well. Did you play basketball, Jackie? I did play basketball. Just, I loved basketball. Yeah. But, you know, one one person doing their best means everybody's doing their best. And that's just so important. That's Jackie Chikarico. She's a superstar, great leader. Mary is going to run the marathon next year. And I just want to... <laughs> Okay. I See, support you, Mary. No, thank you. Bye, bye, bye. Gotta saying, go. Bye, bye. Elvin just said goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. You gotta go. Lessons in Leadership. See you next time. This edition of Lessons in Leadership is made possible by the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, the North Ward Center, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Fedway Associates, Inc., and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, 
and my colleague Mary Gamba has been provided by NJ.com, NJBIA, and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIANJ, and Commerce Magazine. This is the Seton Hall story, one that comes to life every day on our campus. This is the place where great minds discover, innovate, collaborate, and find their true calling. This is the place where passion has a purpose, where learning inspires leading. The bonds we make, the values we teach, inspire our community to take heart and take action. This is Seton Hall University. This is what great minds can do.